of spirit in life and through life, God of our many names and no name. It can be so awkward and hard to be blessed on our journeys through this world. This world that springs too late and buckles trees under snow and bends us to under its weight as we seek to bless the minutia of life's loving moments. And we seek to reconcile that love with all the hurt that we see that is happening in our communities, in our country. Our prayer this morning, how do we wonder? How do we be full of awe of life's majesty and its mud and its muck? How do we stand up? How do we march as our children have shown us this week? And they show us all the time and also touch and see the blessing of the green shoot that is lurking beneath the brown. How do we love despite the hurt? How do we be touched and tender enough in the broken world? How do we bless life when life maybe lacks evidence of blessing? This is our work together with our hands to touch, our eyes to hear, and our ears to hear, and our hearts to feel. Let us be held together in several moments of stillness and peace. Our reading this morning is from the wonderful poet uh, Brian Doyle. He used to be the editor of the Portland Magazine until his death too soon this past winter. This is the title. It's one sentence. Desperate prayer for patience with politicians with excellent suits and shoes and meticulous hair and gobs of television makeup who have utterly forgotten that their jobs are finally about feeding and clothing and protecting and schooling children. They are driving me stark, stuttering, bubbly, insane. They are nattering and preening. They are disassembling and they are speechifying. They are evading question and mouthing empty slogans. They are attacking straw men of their own devising and calculating the market share. Their words are wind and dust. And meanwhile, children starve and have no beds. And teachers and doctors, they can't be safe in school. They say they will do things. They appeal to the worst in us. So to be able to make money, they send children to war, though they have never been in war and do not know savagery of what they're sending their children to do. They abuse their power and sneer at the poor and condescend to the elderly and lie about their own motivations and their biographies. They would happily soil every lake and river and pond and creek and rivulet with every imaginable searing death-dealing chemical if there was enough money in it. They seem not to care about our children and our children's children. They pose for photo ops on the way to church, but they do not feed the hungry and clothe the naked and slake the thirst of those who are thirsty. Dear sweet Lord, give the patience to be reasonable and call them calmly to account. Give them the startle of guilt and the ripple of shame. Make sore their consciences and shiver their arrogance so that they may puncture it themselves and so begin to achieve humility and be of actual, honest, genuine service to the least among us. This we pray, trying not to snarl over much. And so, amen. So here is our world. Beautiful and terrible things happen. Let us keep our hearts tender. 
Let's keep our eyes soft. Because what shows up as conceit or bad manners is often a sign of things no eyes have seen and no ears have heard. And so we learn again how there is no answer but to love one another. And we gather in a community like this to practice being the person that we say we want to be. We cannot do everything, but we can do something. And that something is not nothing. So in the words of Leonard Cohen, forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That is how, my friends, the light gets in. So I have um, two children, almost 18 and 14. And when the kids were younger, winter break, which we just had in February and sometimes in March, um, was often a marathon. It was a whole week long, a marathon of Legos and board games. You remember these board games like uh, Sorry and Uno and Shoots and Ladders. And it was interspersed with, with blessed TV time. <laughs> Even if the TV shows for, I don't know if you know these, but like Phineas and Ferb and SpongeBob. And I'm convinced that kids love these shows so much because they torture the parents who have to watch them with them. The six words, Dad, watch, this is so funny. Uh, it's the greatest lie that a child will ever tell you. <laughs> you know, but time goes on. And I sometimes wonder, where does it go, time? And somewhere, somehow, along the line, these two little babies of mine are now tall-bodied, sleeping, eating, studying, time with friends more than time with parents, teenage cherubs, who will, to their credit, still play board games with their mom and myself and watch TV. But now, it's our turn to say, kids, watch. This is so funny. <laughs> but this year, for the first time, on a recent February break, this is what it sounded like. Dad, Mom, what days are we going to go visit colleges this week? Monday, right? Wednesday, too, and Friday. You want me to drive on the way back? I know you get tired now. <laughs> Home by five, right? Because I'm hanging out with friends later. Can I get ten bucks to fill up the car? Did you even realize, Dad, how expensive gasoline is? <laughs> no, I had no idea. <laughs> and, so, and so we went, leaving behind the, the radius of home, both in car and in imagination, in miles and in future plans. We don't raise children to stay home, of course, but that doesn't make it any easier to see your heart walk outside of your body in the body of another human being casting the net wide and the vision far and the possibilities as distant as the ocean horizon that you all see here in, in P-Town. And it is such a privilege. It is such a privilege that we have to be able to imagine for our kids a future. To go to college, it's a privilege. And it takes hard work. And... a lot of tears and a lot of joy. And so all of that was mixing in as, as my son and I, because my wife was working, went uh, west on the pike one day and then east another, and then further west even another day. And because I had managed to break my smartphone in that week, that tether and lens through which we so often see and feel the world, right? felt a blend of freedom and fear with him. Freedom from the news and the email and, and fear that I would get lost without GPS and fear that I might miss out on some big headline like Senator Mark Rubio returns all campaign donations made by <laughs> NRA places daisies and all the gun barrels at the gun show that took place, my friends, at Parkland, Florida, three days after the shooting. Or 
How about this headline? Maybe I'd miss this. Asterisk discovered next to Second Amendment reads, FYI, assault rifles aren't what we have in mind here. Because, look, if we're going to have fake news, why not go big? <laughs> Imagining the headlines you would like to see is not a bad spiritual practice. I commend it to you. February and March is college tour time. Did you know that? And if you paid attention, if you were off the Cape and, and, uh, and on the Pike maybe, you would have seen all colors of license plates uh, the last few weeks parading back and forth on 90. Cars filled with, with juniors, high school juniors and parents and sometimes unwilling, steeply bribed younger siblings. Turn left, turn right, go straight, no that left, all into the East Coast beautiful, ivied, budget-busting colleges and universities. The family streaming in to gleaming admissions offices, holding folders under their arms. The parents scanning the financial aid documents and tuition, and the students scanning club opportunities and meal plans, and, and maybe academics. <laughs> Emerson and I had a habit of sitting in the back at these tours, just kind of checking things out, right? And from there, I watched all of these families streaming in, especially the kids, and I noticed their nervous excitement and their energy as they snuck looks of comparison to the kids next to them trying to imagine if this next big step in life was for them. Those kids so full of excitement and fear, so wonderful, so scary. Do you remember? These kids, me in the back, these kids, not lost on me, folks. The same ages as those kids who were shot in Parkland, was it five and a half weeks ago now? These kids, not lost on me, the same ages of, of those other kids who we have, we saw yesterday. I was in Boston with my congregation yesterday. And we have seen on TV, these kids have called with their pain and their rage, have called us to action in such a profound way. They chanting shame and BS to the politicians that Brian Doyle spoke about, who they blame for failing to protect them. I wonder, maybe you have, that some of those kids who have been on TV, some of those kids who were killed, were planning their own college tours. And they will never get to go on them. these kids who some have called crisis actors. These kids who will never get a chance. It makes me very angry. Over the tours of um, all these colleges that I've done this year, we've done a lot, I've become a, um, a connoisseur. <laughs> a connoisseur of the admissions pitch. And it, it's a soft sell of meal tickets, and there's the, always the exuberant sophomore who gets on stage and tells us how she's loving every single moment. And then there's the sober biology professor who thought it was a good idea <laughs> to describe how much time you can expect to spend in the lab. And then, and then the admissions officer always comes up with bags under her eyes who tries to make you believe that she just can't wait to read all of those essays. <laughs> but most memorable by far was the video that we watched, he and I, on this big screen it lowered from the ceiling. And it, and it showed, I want you to imagine, it showed a pen line drawing 
of like a university tower. All right? Can you see it in your mind's eye? Like that's the gateway to college. And then it pulled back and it drew a pen line of a, of a young kid, a college age kid. And then it drew a big arrow from the kid to the front doors of that imagined university. Can you see it? And then underneath the arrow, the question popped up, so what will it take for Aaron this imagined child to gain admission here. And then up in the corner of this drawing on this beautiful screen, which is why the tuition is so much, I'm sure, 3.9 GPA, check. 90th percentile on SAT, ACT, check. Honors classes, check. Extracurriculars to show you're not just a book hound, check. Personal, profound, true essay in less than 200 words, check. Three letters of recommendation, two from teachers and one from a guidance counselor, check. It is hard. And then the admissions officer says to all of these kids, and all of these parents. What do you think, everybody? Will Aaron get in? Will she get accepted? And I, I watched as all of the kids in that room, so more than us here, kind of leaned forward in their chairs in hope and fear seeing themselves in Aaron and maybe not wondering if they had what it took to, to get in, to get accepted, to gain entry. Such a loaded question, isn't it? And I'm watching this and watching the qualifications to gain entry and gain acceptance and I'm found myself in the back with my beautiful baby boy who's now almost a man thinking of those kids from Parkland these last weeks wondering about their outlines right and the qualities they're showing us up in the corner said Emma Gonzalez, and I hope you will find time to, to watch her speech that she offered yesterday. And in the first one, this first speech that she gave, she's saying to everyone, she's saying, we are not going to be the, we are going to be the last mass shooting, she said. We are going to change the law. And now when you watch it, you will see her, her tears down her eyes as she rages forth with conviction, an expression of vulnerability and strength, she says, we are going to change the law. That's going to be Marjorie Stoneham Douglas in that textbook that you read about. And it's all going to be due to the tireless efforts of the school board, she said, and the faculty, and the family members, and most importantly, she said, the students like me. And then she called out in between tears from her eyes, she called out Trump for taking millions from the NRA for his campaign. And she said, if you don't do anything to prevent this from continuing to occur, that number of gunshot victims will go up and the number that they are worth will go down, she said. And she said, we will be worthless to you. And so I'm wondering in the back, of all of these university admissions offices, I'm wondering, what will it take for voices like Emma's to gain entry, to get acceptance, to gain admission into the national conversation and help us build the world that I want to live in? Are you hearing me? Emma, in the corner, is she speaking truth, truth to power? Check. Conviction? Check. Vulnerability mixing with strength? Check. Determination? 
the kind of brave that I want to be and I think you want to be? Check. And this is why that my wife Karen and I keep telling our son and be the best kid that you can be, be the best student, you know, do great on your test, study, all that stuff. Awesome. But listen, even more, be the person the world is calling you to become. Be that person. That person, by the way, that, that probably doesn't get you this, the tuition scholarship to some fancy school. Be that person that the world is calling you to be and everything will be okay. Right? Ever since Sandy Hook in, in December 2012, I remember I was, I was in the place where I write my sermons on my bed on a Friday afternoon. And my wife called me from work and she said, you have to stop writing because this terrible thing has happened. And you got to turn on the TV. Do you remember that day? I ripped up whatever sermon I had that day and you know, it was Music Sunday, we changed everything. And I stood up in the pulpit of this community I've been in now for 15 years, these people that I love. And I challenged myself and them into conversations of gun rights and gun control. I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up with guns. And it has not been easy these last many years. Not least because there are just so many issues that draw our attention and claim our passion. And also because I think that we have all grown weary of the public liturgy that happens after every mass shooting. And we know what the liturgy looks like, right? The flags go down, we revere our first responders, we, you know, mourn innocent victims, you know, we mourn the balkanization of politics, and then, you know, something else happens in the news, our smartphones beep, and we're off running to a different place. All of us, me, maybe you, trapped between what can be done and what we can do, right? But watching these kids yesterday, my daughter who led the walkout at her school, and she's in eighth grade, watching her, watching these kids in the parade has sparked something new in me. And maybe in you too. So that while my son is envisioning his future and, and reaching toward it and asking about acceptance, what kind of qualities he needs to get in to the world, I'm asking about the qualities that I need and in my role as a minister to help inspire qualities that you need to envision the kind of future where the sanctification of the gun is no longer the wedge that drives us apart. And that is why I quote for you that Edward Everett Hale line that says, we cannot do everything but we can do something and that something is not nothing. We Unitarian Universalists who have, um, we sanctify perfection in our work. And we sometimes think if we can't do everything, then it just is not worth doing. We need to be inspired by these kids enough to put our bodies where our beliefs are. I need to practice my preaching more than giving, I don't know, preaching that's practiced. Right? That's what it felt like yesterday watching these kids and watching their signs. Favorite sign I saw, two favorites. Tickets to Hamilton are harder to get than guns. <laughs> 
And a young woman, like a teenager, 15, 16, my body is more regulated than guns are. These are hard conversations. These are hard moments. But I think, I forgot your name when you stood up and lit the candle, but said like something about um, this time and seeing the children who lead us. Scripture says, and a child will lead them. And that is feeling true to me now. So my invitation to you is after we have some coffee this morning um, that you join me for, uh, I have a couple uh, conversation starters for us around this uh, topic because I believe that that's where it begins is in how much less about me giving you a sermon and, and you uh, having the chance to, to discover and to feel what is the sermon in you. That's, that's where it begins, I think. We will sing, um, let us speak with bravest fire. And as we hear these words, I want you to think about that space and that word. What does it mean for you to be called into a brave space in distinction from a safe space? Where is the bravery leading you and your body in these days?